Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, I have the absolute pleasure to welcome back my good friend Being Scared, the master of the Rainy Nights. I'm so happy that he agreed to collaborate with me on this two hour long special in the rain. Of course, it's not just on my channel though. We have another whopping two hours of content over on his that is launched right now. Don't miss out. Be sure to watch the video straight after this one to keep the horror marathon going. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. When I was 13, my mom, my younger brother and I were living with my mother's parents. We had escaped my mom's seriously abusive, psychopathic husband. And while living with my grandparents wasn't ideal, we needed a safe place for my mum to physically recover. My grandmother had trailers and sheds on the property that she would rent out to people who needed a cheap place to live but had no other options, such as undocumented workers or people with criminal records. Most of them were really nice and kept to themselves. And then there was Steve. Steve started asking my mum out. She was straight with him and told him no. She was still dealing with her husband's threats and had no interest in dating for the next several years. But he kept asking, then begging, then arguing. He wouldn't take no for an answer. He started following her around. We'd be at the bus stop, and Steve would be watching us from across the street. We'd be getting dinner, and he'd sit outside the diner, watching us through the window. I'd even see him following me from school. We stopped letting my brother walk to his school alone, because Steve would follow him too. He was always around. Then he started whispering outside our bedroom windows. Every night for hours, the three of us would sit huddled in the dark, listening to Steve ranting and raving, begging, shouting and threatening. He would call my mum his angel, his soulmate, a whore, a tease, a demon all while trying to peer through the blinds. He was escalating. But why didn't you call the police, you ask yourself? Simple. Grandma made it very clear. Steve was a paying tenant, and much more valuable to her than her own stupid useless daughter. If mum cost her money, she'd throw us back out onto the street which would cost her custody of my brother, and my brother would not survive his father on his own. So we were trapped. One night during his ranting, Steve had an epiphany. Of course my mum loved him too. Of course she wanted to be with him. The only thing keeping them apart were her children. They could be together once my brother and I disappeared. I can still remember how calm and sympathetic he sounded when he assured her that he'd take care of everything and that they would be together soon. She didn't have to worry about us anymore. He would handle getting rid of us. The next morning, mum contacted my stepdad to ask him how to defend us physically. My stepdad Knowing my mum literally couldn't defend herself against an irritated cat, convinced my mum to tell him the problem. He told her to go home and not to worry about it. He'd talk to Steve. I don't know what my stepdad said to Steve. I don't know what he did. But Steve was gone before I got home from school that day. He'd only taken what he could carry and disappeared. 
So, Steve, you made an already bad situation terrifying. My brother and I aren't children anymore. So, for your sake, let's not meet. I remember seeing the house for the first time. I was seven years old. My parents had just bought their first home. I remember I used to hate living in the cramped, dingy apartment that we previously inhabited and opened the door to our new home with wide-eyed wonder. It blew my mind how spacious this house was. I went upstairs to scope out my bedroom. I was so excited that I was getting my own room and did not have to share a room with my little brother anymore. On my grand tour of my new house, I finally made it down to our basement. The basement was nothing like the rest of the house. The upstairs was elegant and classy. The basement was cold, metallic, and sterile. The ceiling covered in ancient pipes, winding in grotesque angles. The floor covered in rough cement. I recall taking a look at the stairs for the first time and being immediately struck with how odd they were. The stairs were surrounded in drywall, which clashed with the rest of the basement. One particular section of the wall was colored differently than the rest. It stood out like a sore thumb. I inched closer and felt the texture of it. It felt very strange. I then knocked on it. A hollow sound pervaded the empty air of the basement. Something about that sound immediately bothered me. I walked up the stairs as I could hear the same hollow sound echo in the emptiness of the basement. As we settled into our new home, I began to get comfortable with my surroundings. The house began to feel familiar. Everywhere, that is, except for the basement. It just always put me off, and I avoided going down there as best as I could. Our family couldn't be happier. My loving father and mother doted over me and my little brother. My life was perfect. Then, it began. I would hear strange noises. When I pointed it out to my parents, they told me that the house was just settling in. One night in particular indicated that something wasn't right. I snuck downstairs to the kitchen for a late night snack. As I closed the refrigerator, I heard a tapping sound cut through the silence of the night. I craned my head to see if I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from. Dread began to wash over me as I realized the tapping was coming from the basement. I inched my way over to the basement door. I opened it to see the blackness of the depths below. My ears perked up. There it was again, that hollow tapping sound. The same sound I had heard on my initial visit to the basement from hitting the drywall. I turned on the lights so that I could go downstairs and investigate. The tapping continued as I took the first step. Fear overtook me. I ran back to my room and hid under my covers until the morning light gave way to a new day. I remember walking down the stairs. Being the first one up and about, I ran to the living room to play Nintendo. On my way, I passed the door to the basement. It was shut. Though I was in a state of near panic when I ran from it the previous night, I distinctly remember leaving the door open and not turning off the lights. I rationalized that my mother or father must have gone down there for some reason. Later, I mentioned the incident to my parents, and they just assured me that what I heard was the sound of the hot water heater clicking in the night. I knew better, but welcomed a logical explanation. About a month after the move, my mother asked me to run downstairs and grab a load of socks, as our washer and dryer were in the basement. I reluctantly told her that I would. It was the middle of the day, and enough time had passed to dull the fear I had felt a week prior. I turned on the lights and ran downstairs, hearing the hollow sound echo with my footsteps. A cold sweat started to form on me. I made my way to the dryer and grabbed a basket. I pulled the socks out hastily and shoved them into the basket. After I shut the door to the dryer, I surveyed my surroundings. The stillness of the basement was so eerie. Then I heard it, a faintly audible whisper. 
At first, I thought it was somebody calling from upstairs, and their voice scarcely making it down into the basement. However, this was not the case. That sound was coming from the basement, specifically from under the stairs. As I stood frozen with fear, it began to increase in volume, but still remained barely above the threshold of human perception. What was being said incomprehensible to my young ears. Then it stopped as quickly as it began. I moved towards the stairs, keeping my eye on the oddly colored portion of the drywall. As I took my first step to escape this ever-growing nightmare, the most profoundly terrifying moment of my life occurred. A loud, hollow bang shook the stairs, almost knocking me to the ground. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me. Through tears and shaking uncontrollably, I told my parents what happened. They tried their best to calm me down, but nothing they said could ease my mind. I told them in no uncertain terms that I would never go down to the basement again. They must have been convinced of how terrified I was because they honored my request and never sent me down there again. After another three months in the house, things returned to normalcy for me. And honestly, there was about a two week period where I was happy again. The last time happiness would exist in my life or my family's for that matter. One moment in particular comes to mind. I remember lifting up little Jonathan above my head lovingly as his pacifier fell out of his mouth and brushed against my nose, tickling me. I pulled him in for a big bear hug and remember how he smelled. That wonderful smell that babies emit and, for the last time, feeling content. Any semblance of contentment came crashing down for me and my parents the night of July 2nd, 1991. That is the day that Jonathan went missing. A ransom note was scrawled in barely legible English and left in his bed demanding $20,000 cash. It informed my parents that if they contacted the police, they would kill Jonathan. My mother and father took to their room and argued loudly and emotionally over whether or not to call the police as I listened with tears streaming down my eyes. My mother eventually wore down my father and the police were called. Seeing as the location of the drop and time were indicated on the note, the police set up a wiretap just in case the kidnapper decided to call. I asked my parents and the police if they had thoroughly searched through the house in case he was still here. They assured me that they had, and that Jonathan would be fine after the drop, but the seed of an idea was already growing in my mind that would blossom throughout the rest of my life. My parents followed the instructions to a T. They dropped off the money and then waited in the location that they were supposed to pick up Jonathan. He never came. Needless to say, this tore my family apart. As the weeks passed, there was no news about Jonathan. My young, vibrant parents became husks of their former selves. My mother especially. She blamed herself for getting the police involved and believed that to be the reason Jonathan was not returned. One night, as she was sobbing alone in shambles, clutching a bottle of wine, I finally decided to divulge to her my theory that had been brewing inside my skull. I told her that I thought it was whoever, or whatever for that matter, was under the stairs that had gotten Jonathan, and maybe he is still alive. She slapped me across the face so hard that I saw stars. She screamed at me, the guilt expressing itself as rage. She told me to stop the childish bullshit and just accept that Jonathan was taken out of the house by a demented person and is dead. My childhood died that day. I remember contemplating taking a hammer and exposing whatever was under the stairs myself, but the fear was just too overwhelming for me to actually do it, let alone step one stair down into that basement. My family moved shortly after this incident. I remember looking to the future with what might resemble optimism only to have it come crashing down. My parents divorced. 
the grief was too much to share, and not a year after that, my mother killed herself. The guilt must have just overwhelmed her. My father did his best to raise me, but Jonathan's long shadow always hung over our lives. Twenty years later, I began to think long and hard about my little brother's disappearance and how angry it made me. My family had a chance at a normal and fulfilling life, and it was snuffed out in an instant by whoever took him. I wasn't just robbed of a little brother, I was robbed of any chance of happiness. As I grew up, I accepted the official story of what happened. But lately, curiosity began to get the better of me. I began driving past the old house, seeing that it was currently vacant. Ideas began to swirl in my head. So, I broke into the house, bolstered by alcohol. I decided to do it, knowing I would likely find nothing under the basement stairs, but hoping that this would close a too long chapter in my life and allow me to finally move on. To my dismay, the stairs sounded exactly the same as I remember they did. A hollow sound pervading the emptiness of the basement. I stare at the spot in the drywall, still discolored, still just as ominous as when I was a child. However, fear was not going to stop me. In fact, I was feeling the opposite. I was feeling a courage I hadn't felt in a long time. The moment of truth was upon me. With all the force within me emboldened by years of pent-up rage, I ran toward the wall shoulder first. The drywall came crashing down around me. I opened my eyes as my bravery was immediately eroded and turned into absolute horror. Bones. Bones everywhere. My horror increased to unimaginable heights as I surveyed the tight space seeing the skeletons everywhere, the light playing menacingly on their tiny frames. Tattered pieces of paper were everywhere with God only knows what written on them. There must have been the remains of 20 to 30 children when I realized that with no exceptions, they were all missing their skulls. One particularly tiny one begged for my attention. I became weak in the knees and fell backwards when I saw what were unmistakably bite marks up and down the tiny forearm. As I hit the ground, I expected to hear a dull thud as I landed on the concrete. Instead, I heard a hollow sound. I looked to see what I had landed on. A trap door. Finding new courage, summoning strength I didn't know I had, I opened it. Below me lay a dark tunnel, a crawl space that could barely fit a person lying on their stomach. The dank smell wafting upward made me reluctant, but I knew what I had to do. Before I was conscious of what my muscles were doing, I found myself crawling through the darkness toward whatever lay on the other side. As I reached the end of the tunnel, I looked up to see a sliver of light cutting through the darkness. I pushed upwards. Cautiously, I poked my head up. To my surprise, the tunnel had led to the other side of the stairs. I crawled out to find myself in the corner of the basement, facing the stairs behind a dryer covered in years of dust. The implications of all of this sent my mind reeling, but before I could form a coherent thought, the lights turned off in the basement. My heart caught in my throat as I began to hear someone descending the stairs, slow but sure steps announcing I was no longer alone. With every thud, my heart skipped a beat. I began to hear that incomprehensible whispering in my mind the familiar sound reigniting the fear and woe of my lost childhood. Worrying the darkness would not adequately hide me, I sought cover by ducking behind the dryer, not willing to take the risk of catching a glimpse, though every fiber of my being screamed at me to do so. Panic began to set in. What am I going to do when this person discovers their lair has been revealed? While I was mulling over my options, the screaming began. I say scream as a frame of reference, but there is no way to truly describe the guttural noises that I heard. The sounds smashing the silence of the basement were 
so bone-chilling, so surreal as to defy description. He clearly had discovered his perverse sanctuary had been disturbed. Before I knew it, I was up the stairs running for my life. I made it to my car too scared to turn around. With all muscles working in unison, I opened the door and put the key in the ignition in one swift movement. As my car sprang to life under the streetlight, a shadow fell over my car. I gunned it, never looking back, flooring the accelerator to the local police precinct. I breathlessly tried to explain to the attending officer what had occurred and collapsed to the floor mid-sentence. Now, it is a month later. The next day after my discovery, the police launched an investigation and quickly made the same gruesome discovery. I was thanked profusely by the police and the community for what I had found, telling me that they were going to be able to close the books on multiple missing person cases. However, they were not able to find the perpetrator of these heinous crimes. They began to test the DNA of the bodies. A profound sense of relief overcame me when I received the call informing me that one of the tiny skeletons belonged to Jonathan. I shared the news with my father, the look on his face, relief all-encompassing as the burden he had carried for so many years was lifted. We hugged as tears filled both of our eyes. However, the relief has been short-lived. The thing that keeps me up at night is that whoever or whatever did this is still out there. The question that plagues my mind is whether or not this monster is literal or figurative. Either way, I hope I never find out. So we're at this camper near Dover Lights in Arkansas. It's not the fanciest campsite, but we managed to find this guy that spends a lot of time out there while also working. So he just vacations in the woods half the year. The guy offers to let my friend watch the place while he goes to visit his son. My friend automatically invites me and some other people to come hang out, and we spend a few days there drinking, smoking, fishing, and just messing around. All in all, pretty okay, until my female friend gets super drunk and barges outside in the middle of the night, buck naked, to eat beans by the handful out of a cold pot. As someone who admires cleanliness, I follow her out to try and make sure she doesn't hurt herself while everyone else just laughs. So there she is, covered in beans, and I'm trying to convince her to settle down and clean herself off with a towel when suddenly her head shoots up like a deer in headlights. She just glares at the trees around us. We're alone, and it's pitch black. She glares before literally growling and then sprinting into the woods. I have no idea what to do. I've completely lost sight of her, and she's naked in the woods by herself. A few failed attempts to call out to her, and I do the stupidest thing I could have done by following her. About five meters into the complete darkness, I look down and see a faint light from someone's phone. Picking it up, I see it's in camera mode, and there are pictures of us, very recent pictures, all in creepy night vision mode, with some looking like they were taken from the window of the camper, and the last one is of my friend running directly towards the camera. Realizing what happened, I delete the pictures and drop the phone on a rock, crushing the screen with my foot. Still unable to find her and freaking out, I double back to the camper for help, only to find her still very drunk in a lawn chair naked. Carrying her back inside, I let her boyfriend towel her off, and they both pass out spooning on the bottom bunk. I never told them what really happened, and she didn't remember in the morning. But I did lock the door and wake up every hour to just keep an eye on things. I'm an 18-year-old girl, living in a farm type of town in England. Everyone knows me, and always calls me by my nickname, Ren. It's an abbreviation of my first name. I'm a hairstylist, 
in a well-known salon in my town. All of the clients live close to the area. And sometimes people travel from surrounding towns to come to us. So work is always busy. Other than myself, there's one stylist who is also my boss. And we have a self-employed beautician who I get along with very well. We're a very tightly knit salon, and there is never any trouble. One day, as we were just closing up shop, and I was about to start mopping the salon floor, a tall male walked in and called my attention by yelling out, Hello? I sigh internally, and just hope he's booking an appointment for another day, as it's been an 11 hour day. And all I wanted to do was to go home to my flat, sit with my cat, and watch stuff on TV until I fell asleep. I put on my salon face, which is a welcoming smile, and say, Hello, how can I help? His eyes seemed to light up when he saw my face. I'm quite short for my age, about 5 foot 5, and weigh about 112 pounds. I have quite a few piercings, which are mainly facial, and have tattoos up both of my arms. I know it's a bother, and the sign says closed, but I really need my hair cut. I'm going to a wedding tomorrow. He says this, with his eyes not leaving mine. I walk towards the reception desk, which he was leaning on, and look at the appointment book. I'm afraid I'm the only one here and I'm about to lock up. We can get you in for 8.30 tomorrow morning, I say, trying my best not to show my exhaustion. I really need this done now, he says in a tone of voice, getting progressively lower. Okay, take a seat, I say, giving him another soft smile. I grab a gown from the wall and walk over to the station he sat down at. He's taken off his jacket to see his arms are covered in tattoos. I plug in the clippers and ask him what he wants. He says he wants the usual. Short back and sides and a small trim on the top. Every male in the area gets the same thing. So it would only take me about ten minutes. As I cut his hair, he makes small talk asking how my day was, if I liked working in the salon, and how I got into hairdressing. He then goes on to tell me his life story, and he says, Yeah, the wedding I'm going to tomorrow is my brother's. He's getting married to my ex-girlfriend. I tell him I was sorry, and ask if he and his ex were on good terms, to which he replies, Yeah. As I finish his haircut, I remove the gown and dust off the back of his neck with a soft brush. When he stands up, I then realise how tall he is. He must have been about six foot four, and I quickly run my eyes over him completely before hanging the gown back up on the wall and quickly walking back to the reception desk. How much do I owe you? He asks. That's 850 please. I say, feeling my eyes beginning to drop slightly. He hands me a 20 and says, keep the change. I smile gratefully and put the change in my pocket. And as I turn off the register, I wish him a good night and walk out the back room, putting on my coat and grabbing my backpack. I'll just mop tomorrow afternoon. My boss will understand. I lock the back door. Walking into the salon, I go to switch the lights off. My keys in hand, and I see the same guy is still standing at the reception desk. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to ask for your number, he says, giving me a nervous smile. He looked really cute. He was definitely my type of guy. Tall, muscular, tattooed, and brown eyes. Can I give it to you when we're outside? I really need to lock up, I ask. He nods and opens the door for me. I switch off the lights and radio 
before quickly walking out of the salon. And he walks behind me and waits for me to lock the door. I then give him my number and tell him to have a nice night. And then start my 20 minute walk back home. For the next three weeks, he and I text non-stop. I found out that his name was Matthew. He added me on Facebook and Snapchat, and also followed me on Instagram. Things were going well. We'd been on one date, and he took me to the cinema, and we went to a dessert bar afterwards. We were arranging a second date, when he sent me a picture on Snapchat. I opened to see him posing like he always did, outside my house. How did he know where I lived? I never told him. He'd never dropped me home. I always got the bus home from the town centre whenever we went out on our dates. Had he been following me? I replayed the message and screenshotted it. And then I text him asking, Why are you outside my house? He didn't reply. Not for about an hour. And then he sent another picture. He was laying on his bed, with the same pose and caption as before. I'm not. I ignored him for the rest of the night, and resisted texting him as much. After four days of me not replying to him, he shows up at the salon, asking for a haircut with me. My boss told him that I was busy, but that she could do it, but he was adamant that he would wait until I was free. He sat there for almost three hours, and it got to the point where my other clients were uncomfortable because he was just sat there, not moving, just watching me. I went out to the back room to go to the toilet, and my boss called her husband, who was a six foot four builder and who was terrified. After 20 minutes of my boss's husband and Matthew talking, Matthew finally left. But that wasn't the end of it. He would sit on a bench across the road from my salon and watch me all day. Didn't he have a job? It's been eight months since the night that Matthew came into the salon for a haircut. It's been eight months that he's been stalking me. He still watches me at work. I've blocked him on everything, but he got a burn phone and would text and call me constantly. He made no accounts under different names on all social medias and added me to keep tabs on me. I told the police, printed everything off. But this is England and the police do nothing. They told me, you're just overreacting. Tell him to leave you alone. I just got home from work. It's 10.30 p.m. And I got another Snapchat from Matthew. I remember the apartment being eerily cold when we walked in. It was probably in the low 60s outside, but it somehow felt even colder in our one-bedroom domicile than it did in the draft courtyard. I mentioned it to Ben. He didn't even respond. He already had the game on and was complaining about the luck of the football team from some city across the country he would never even go to. I'm gonna warm up in the shower. I put the statement out there 60% as a notification and 40% as an offer. Ben responded with a sound that I'm not even sure qualifies as a grunt. I let the shower warm up and then slipped in. I felt the grime of the workday the after-work drinks that we had to have with Ben's boss and the chill of the night wash off me as soon as the stream of water hit my body. The first couple of minutes of the shower were utter bliss, one of those moments when you feel like nothing else in life could ever be better. I never wanted to get out. Then I heard the sound of Ben peeing on the other side of the shower curtain. Ben. I said in a thoroughly annoyed tone, please just don't flush the toilet. I heard the urine stop. I didn't hear the toilet flush. I heard Ben walk out of the bathroom. 
I showered for another 10 minutes before I got out. I dried off and headed back to the bedroom. I glanced over at Ben on the couch, still glued to the game. I heard him muttering something about a fumble. Thanks for not flushing the toilet, I said before ducking into our bedroom. I didn't go to the bathroom, Ben said. I stopped in the doorway and then walked back into the living room. Don't lie, I heard you peeing when I was in the shower. Ben threw his hands up, eyes still on the game. I have not gotten up from this seat since we walked in. It's overtime. Ben insisted in his tone where I know he is telling the truth about something. The warmth of the hot shower slithered off me in a second. Don't mess with me, I stated coldly to Ben. I swear to God I didn't go in there. The entire room started to feel dangerous. I didn't even know what to do. I stood there shivering in nothing but a towel. Ben rose to his feet and walked towards me. I watched his eyes scan the room with a fear in them I had never seen before. He stopped in the doorway and grabbed me. He covered my mouth and perked his ear. I didn't hear anything other than the distant, ominous ring of a siren. We stood silent for a few more moments. I heard nothing. The siren was gone. We would hear something if someone was in here, Ben said. Ben reluctantly agreed to search the apartment. We searched the place up and down and found nothing. It was actually worse than finding a junkie with a bloody knife or some hideous monster. The mystery of the whole thing was worse than any nightmare I could have imagined. The next few weeks were tense. I wouldn't stay in the apartment alone. Ben told me my brain must have just played a trick on me. That was a bad idea. He said there was no other possible way it could have happened. It was not a good idea on his part to tell me that. I lost trust in him. What happened was definitely not in my head. I knew it. I got my confirmation a few weeks later when I stood in the shower getting ready for work. I was almost done with the shower when I heard a flush ring out from the other side of the shower curtain. I couldn't dodge the water in time and took a stinging hot stream to the face. I screamed out and ripped open the shower curtain. No one was there, but I heard footsteps walking away from the open bathroom door. I heard the front door unlock, open, and then close again. Ben? I called out, my body cold despite the hot water pounding on my back. No answer. I shivered into a towel and walked into the bedroom. No sign of Ben. I checked out the living room. There was a handwritten note on the coffee table. I had to go to work early today. Signed, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Very helpful. I called him. He was clearly annoyed. Worse yet, he confirmed that he did not flush the toilet when I was in the shower. He left before he even heard the shower come on, apparently. I listened to the space around me in the apartment. I don't even know what Ben said after that point. Everything was silent, but it felt like the entire apartment was alive at that point. I ended the call with Ben. One thing was clear, whoever had been sneaking around the bathroom while I was showering had a way to get in and out of our apartment. Or it was Ben and he wanted to deeply disturb me for some reason. Ben continued to swear up and down that it was not him doing this. He brought up the idea of me inventing the whole thing in my head again. I offered a solution. What if we set up cameras in the apartment? I wanted to record the entire apartment. Ben didn't want to spend that much money. We settled on recording the front door and the bathroom. I reviewed the tapes each day at work. Weeks went by without so much as a hint of anyone doing anything at any moment of the day, let alone when I was in the shower. All I saw was Ben and I going about our sad daily existence of barely talking to each other and going back and forth to work. The fear that all of this was in fact in my head started to bubble. 
I felt a tension from Ben when he asked me about every other day if I saw anything on the camera. Our already strained relationship felt like it was hanging by a single thread. We were barely talking. Then, it came to a head when I reviewed the footage about a month after I set up the cameras. The footage from the bathroom proved fruitful while I was in the shower. I felt I could almost smell the soap and feel the moisture in the air when I stopped the bathroom footage once I saw a shadow appear in the screen of the bathroom window. I stopped breathing as I watched that shadow pull away the screen and then slither into the room. The light wasn't very good in the bathroom with me taking the shower after my nightly workout just around dusk and I hadn't turned on the bathroom light. However, I could see what looked to be a stout man in black pants, a hoodie, and wearing a pure white mask standing in my bathroom right next to me as I took a shower. I couldn't believe I still showered with the curtain closed at that point. I hated myself almost as much as I was scared as I watched the footage. Those feelings burned as I watched the man just stand there for a few seconds before heading over to the toilet. The sound of the shower stopped on the video, replaced by the pouring sound of the rest of the shower water exiting via the bathroom faucet. I would open the curtain any second. I wondered how in the hell I hadn't caught the man dressed in black the night before when I got out of the shower. What I watched next made the vomit literally bubble up in the back of my throat. I couldn't believe what I saw. In a flash, the man reached down, stuck his fingers against the floor of our bathroom, and yanked on one of the tiles. I watched about half of the bathroom floor rise up, and about a foot off the ground, the man slipped into the dark opening he unveiled and then disappeared into the floor before it slowly eased back into the ground right when I opened up the shower curtain. I watched myself get out of the shower grab a towel and head to the bedroom in real time and then fast forwarded through the rest until the new video ran out. The guy never got out of the floor, meaning he had been in there the entire night until I left for work and could still be in the apartment. One burning thought simmered in my mind when the realization washed over me. It was the day before Veterans Day and Ben had the day off while I didn't. He was still at home with the man in the bathroom floor. I scrambled to call Ben as soon as I could, but there was no answer. I called again. No answer. I called the cops and drove back home without telling my boss anything. The cops were already there when I arrived. They busted down the door under my phone direction and found the apartment entirely empty. There was no one in the hollowed out section beneath the bathroom floor and Ben's cell phone was in the bedroom, but he was not. The police found spikes stuck in the side of the building which led all the way up from the alley behind our building to our third floor bathroom window. They looked to be what a mountain climber would stick in the rock of a cliff to pull their way up. They believe he must have lived in one of the other tall apartment complexes nearby and spied on me. They believe he broke in during the day sometime over and over again while the two of us were at work and cut out our bathroom floor and then dug out the area to create a hiding space a little bigger than himself where he could hide when he needed to. They said he seemed incredibly skilled at what he did and likely had been doing it at the apartments all around our neighborhood. The story of Ben was far more disturbing. The police found his car parked on the sidewalk a few blocks away in its usual spot and his cell phone on top of the bed. But that was it. He vanished without a trace. I have since moved out of the apartment and Ben has yet to show up. I moved a few cities over back to my parents' home to try and throw the scent off from whoever was doing it. The limited clues and leads the police possess have been shared over the past few months, but none of them seem to lead anywhere.
There is one insight the officers gave to me that has stuck with me throughout the process and my lonely days of working, watching TV on my parents' couch and struggling to sleep. One of the officers told me that they don't think that Ben had anything to do with the sneak-ins of the masked assailant or his disappearance, but they think I should be on the lookout for people in my life. I can still remember the cop's exact words. They were. Generally, in cases like this, people think it is some random mystery man that is coming in and doing something creepy, but in reality, the perpetrator almost always has something connected to the person they are terrorizing. Most of the time, it's someone they know. Good luck ever trusting anyone again. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana, Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants. So I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all our gear and saddlebags and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. We started out on the second day and my cousin said, you want to see something weird? Of course I said yes, so she led me up on a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It is one of those that you can plug in or wind up and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries very quickly. Out in the middle of nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and the trees, so naturally I decided to follow the wire out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees and then back to the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally dead ends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wood plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm staring confused as all hell at this desk in the middle of a forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet. It then lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were at had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around, and yet there was a live outlet. It was weird as hell. No spooky jump scares or bodies. Just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. For some background, I am a 23 year old female from a small town in West Virginia. Now, the town I live in is very small. It's a place where everyone knows each other, and the surrounding areas as well. But we have America's Resort, or the Disneyland of the South, or the Emerald of the State, placed right in it. I won't give you the actual name, but it's not hard to find if you decide to Google it. I've lived my entire life here, and got a job as a performer about three years ago. For the most part, my job is great. And considering how old the place is, I consider it very well taken care of. 
at least what the guests see. We have a huge campus for this place, and it's very easy for our guests to get lost, as well as our employees. If you're not careful, you'll find it hard to make your way around. Now, I've never had anything scary happen to me whilst I've been working, ever. Our resort is very well stocked with security guards most of the time, and they are amazing and hardworking, as we monitor everything. Being so big, we have cameras constantly making sure guests, employees, and day travellers are safe. Not once since I've worked here have I ever felt threatened. Which is why this particular situation is so terrifying. So after that long-winded background set, let's get on to the story. This happened last weekend, after my shift. Lately, we've been performing late in a specific dining area of the resort. So by the time we get out, it's 12.30 to 1am. I was dead tired and practically falling asleep making the long trek from our dressing room to the back parking lot on the property where I parked my car. After you go through the hotel, you head to the second entrance that leads to the gardens in our chapel. It's a long winding path and it's basically pitch black with minimal light. After finally making it to the clock out, I walked through the lobby to the north entrance to leave. Once outside, I pulled my hood up. My hood is very thick, and I also had my phone in my pocket, quietly playing music. I hate silence in that long, freezing, dark walk back to my car. I didn't want to only hear my footsteps, but boy was I glad I kept my music quiet. I was walking down the path, passing our chapel, and I heard a crack, kind of like a tree bark, snapping. But it sounded like it was coming from above me. The wind was there, but wasn't strong, so I just kept walking. Then I heard the sound of shuffling feet, and I know the difference between an animal and a human walk. So, I looked behind me, to see if a guest was also taking the same path. We have cottages around the resort, and sometimes if people are intoxicated, they prefer the walk because it's too long of a wait for the shuttles. But no one was behind me. Another mention. Along this path are huge, huge trees with enormous trunks that you could very easily hide behind. I saw no one. I was a little freaked out. I pulled my hood down and turned my music down and kept on walking. I was walking a little fast when I heard another snap and I thought I saw a figure about 50 feet behind me going behind a tree. And that's when I started walking faster to my car, making sure I looked behind me every few seconds. Once I finally reached my car, I looked back and saw someone at the end of the path. What was freakier still though, was that we have manholes with covers that give off steam. And this guy was pulling a Michael Myers Marilyn Monroe bit. His head looked off though, like there was a huge tuft of hair that had just chilled on his head. I got in my car and pulled out. Now because of the way the road is set up, I had to drive back the way he was to leave. So I turn on my high beams before I pass him, and there he is. I'm assuming it was a man in a nice suit with colour and a horse mask, waving. I passed him and sped off towards the back exit and peeled at home. Looking back, I didn't report it to security, because I wasn't sure if I was just being crazy or not. I was quite tired, but not tired enough to imagine that. I'm pretty sure it really happened. All I can hope for is to never encounter this person again.
There's an abandoned insane asylum in Northville, Michigan that my friends and I explored three times. This is the story of the third time and the final time that we ever broke in. I still get chills every time I remember this night. The first two times we went, the asylum was actually more interesting than creepy to explore. Both times we happened to run into very friendly people there. The first time we ran into another group of high school kids. Scared the crap out of them at first. The second time, we met a couple stoner Vietnam vets that gave us a tour of the place. It's an entire complex complete with underground tunnels, a morgue, and lots of files and things from the 50s. This time, however, we were alone and only had two flashlights between three people. Much like the guy with the story about the World War II base, the echoing footsteps sound like they're coming from behind you and always seem to take one more step after you stop. So after exploring much of the asylum like this and being considerably creeped out already, we decide to head to the main building. It's about 18 stories tall and the view from the top is pretty cool because it's by far the tallest building anywhere remotely close and you can see Detroit from up there. We're nearing the top of the seemingly endless stair corridor when the girl that's with us freezes and whispers for us to stop. I heard footsteps. She whispers. I tried to tell her it was just our footsteps echoing, but when both of them made me shut up and listen, I could hear it as clear as day. The unmistakable sound of footsteps coming from the top floor. Now the building is tall, but very small area-wise, so we were very close to the sounds. Still standing on the stairs, we whisper amongst us about what we're going to do. My very stupid friend insists that it's probably just another friendly person and we should go up and say hello. I try to explain to him that you don't want to meet the kind of people that pace the top floor of an old asylum in the middle of the night. We couldn't convince him and he goes to head upstairs, but I said screw this and just started running down the stairs. Fortunately, he followed us and we got out of there without ever finding out who was walking around up there that night. To top it all off, a cop passing by on the road spotted us after coming out of the building and we had to run into the asylum complex to get away. I still think back to that night sometimes and wonder who was up there. There were definitely no guards, so it was probably either a gang of people or the tortured soul of a crazy person. Either way, it was way too close for comfort. There used to be an abandoned rubber factory on the edge of my town before it was torn down a couple years back. I went there once and tried all the doors, but they were barred. But I did find a crack in the concrete wall around the back that was just big enough to slip through. The inside was really neat. There were abandoned boats that must have been in storage for decades. A bunch of old conveyor belts and factory equipment. All kinds of drug paraphernalia. I found a random painting of Jesus in a makeshift shrine. But that's not the creepy part. I was walking around this abandoned factory at about 8 p.m. just after dark. I look around for an hour or so and aside from some old shit, there's really nothing out of the ordinary. Then, I hear music start playing. Something sort of bluesy, somewhere in the factory. I'm not easily scared, and I kind of wanted to figure out what sort of freak was listening to old records in an abandoned factory, because honestly, that's something that I would do. I track down the noise after about five to 10 minutes, and it's in this room in the basement that has the doorway covered with a tarp. I go inside and the room is a huge contrast from the rest of the dingy, dull, old factory. The walls were bright purple and the room was warm, like there was a space heater in it, whereas the rest of the factory was freezing. There's a cassette player on the floor playing a song, which I later tracked down to be Eleanor Rigby by The Beatles but I never found out what the other songs were. 
and a bunch of papers taped to the walls that all say, She gotta run. She gotta run. She gotta run. If I were to guess, there were at least 100 sheets that said the exact same phrase, just plastered on the walls and laying on the floor. There was a chair that looked like it had been detached from a school desk in the corner, and a statue of an animal that was really badly chipped and burned, like someone was trying to destroy it. There was also a stack of VHS tapes that had names of women on the sides. I only remember seeing Jessica on multiple tapes, but there were a few other names. I left shortly after because I got worried whoever owned all of this shit would come back and find me there, and I figured they were in the building with me. I couldn't stop thinking about it for a few weeks. I was convinced it was either a serial killer or some guy with a porn collection that he couldn't risk having at home, or something worse on the tapes. And I went back with a friend, but when we got there, they had already started demolishing the place, and it was inaccessible. I'll always wonder what was on those tapes, but part of me is very glad that I'll never know. I am in my thirties, and a mother of three children, a preteen daughter, and two toddler twins. We live with my mom in a condominium that was once a part of a senior community, but now it's a place that is open to all ages. Because of its history, most of the residents in my complex are retirement age and there is seldom any crime near us. In Arizona, particularly the suburbs of Phoenix, you can be living in a nice middle class area, but just a mile or two down the road, it can get pretty run down and sketchy. It is just one of the quirky things about the Phoenix metropolitan area. It's hard to picture if you live in a state or province with a clear cut good side of town, and a downright scary side of town, but that's just how it is here. One night in February of this year, I decided to go for a walk with my three kids. February, already seeing days with temperatures well over 80 Fahrenheit, and the only way to get fresh air is to go in the evening, otherwise it's too hot for us. So I put my twin toddlers in their umbrella strollers and my 11 year old daughter Tasha and I set out for our walk, each of us pushing one of the twins. We always turn down the road about a block away as it is off the main road and beautifully lined with trees and gorgeous houses. There are usually animals out, which my twins really love to see. This particular night though, my daughter said it felt different. She said it felt as though something bad or strange was going to happen. You hear the myth of women's intuition, but I'm a woman and I have none whatsoever. I'm a business analyst and do not usually go with my gut as much as I try to rationalize everything. So I tried to brush it off. Though, what she said gave me a bit of an ominous feeling. She said it again. It feels like someone's following us. And I again told her it was just her imagination. That no one was there. And I turned around and looked behind me. No one. I thought she was just having an overactive imagination. It was only a couple of moments later that I heard it. I was looking down at my son in his stroller, so I didn't see what my daughter saw. I just heard a beep. My daughter said, look over there. God, I hope they're not going to come over here. Beep, and another beep. It sounded like a beep from hospital equipment or a truck backing up. She said quietly, it's coming over here, mum. I looked up and saw it far enough away, but coming towards us. Someone in a power chair in the dark 
rolling towards us out of literally nowhere. I had no idea where they could have come from, but Tasha was right. They were coming straight for us. The beep got louder and closer, and my daughter and I were both white as sheets. Soon enough, the person was an arm's length away from us. She appeared to either be homeless or somehow down on her luck. And I began to feel a little better about it for a moment, because my rational mind thought, what could a middle-aged woman in a power chair possibly do to four people? That is, until she began to speak. The first thing out of her mouth was, I don't know where the hell to plug my chair in. The beep was from her battery going dead. I did not appreciate her aggressive tone, or her language around my children, but I still remained cordial. She then asked if she could follow me home to use my outlet. Although at times I can be a charitable woman, I did not want a stranger following me to my kid's home, and I didn't know her or the company she kept. So I said no, that we didn't live in this area and that we were visiting from the other side of town. She was angry that no one on the street would let her plug her chair into their outlet, and I wished her good luck and good day, and continued on my way walking and thinking the worst was over. As we walked on our normal path, my daughter told me she still had the heebie-jeebies, so was worried that we would run into her again before we made it home. We still had about 15 or so minutes, until we would be home. The way our route was, we would loop back around a street, and end up back on the street where we originally bumped into the woman. My daughter was still creeped out, so even though I felt like I was able to shake off the unsettling feeling, I told her that we would take a different way home, and I kept assuming that we would not run into the lady again. That, I assured her, because she was running out of battery and would be long gone by the time we made it home. Also, we would take the sidewalk of the main road, so there would be plenty of light and cars driving down the street. For a while, she seemed to forget about our encounter, and we were enjoying our walk again. The twins were falling asleep and everything seemed as if it were back to normal. As we walked down the main road and past the Walgreens drugstore, we were less than a quarter of a mile away from our complex. Our walk was nearing its end, and I figured that we were in the clear. We would go home, watch Gilmore Girls and call it a night, only to find as we passed the apartment complex next to where we lived, the same woman in her power chair was about to turn onto our street. She must have still been looking for someone to let her use their power outlet. But what are the odds that she was about to turn into our condominium complex? Oh no. What are we going to do now, I said. If we go home, we'll pass her and she'll notice us again. Fear began to set in but I tried to keep my feelings under control. I did not want the lady to know where we lived. I did not want her to see us. But it was too late. We were not very hard to miss. As we were pushing two strollers down the sidewalk at night, with the lights still illuminating us, she saw us, and I kid you not, she changed course. She was now coming towards us yet again, heading straight in our direction. It couldn't be. Why on earth would she purposely change direction because of us? She was already told that we wouldn't help her. It just couldn't be real. I looked over to Tasha, who appeared to be quite nervous. She said to get out of here. She was terrified, as was I. And our fear began to feed on each other and magnify by the second. For a moment, 
I contemplated going into the apartment complex to fool the woman or to completely lose her, but changed my mind. It could make things worse, as we would have to hide, and I couldn't imagine hiding with two cumbersome strollers. I said to Tasha under my breath, let's go to Walgreens, knowing that they were still open. And there would be other people besides us. The woman was still following. And by now, my daughter and I were both scared out of our wits. We could not get to Walgreens fast enough. My daughter said, Mum, she's getting faster. She's catching us up. And we started to run. We ran with the strollers. The little ones having no idea what was going on. Lucky for them. Tasha? At that moment, my daughter said to look behind me. I was too afraid to look behind, but I could hear the motorized chair getting closer, gaining speed. What the hell did she want from us? My daughter couldn't help herself, and she turned her head to see the lady following closely behind her. We were very close to the store at that point, but because we were literally being chased, our bodies were pumped full of adrenaline. We picked up speed, making it to the store with the lady still behind us. But we managed to somehow lose her, where she was far enough in back of us that she still wasn't an imminent threat. Somehow we made it to Walgreens safe and sound. I called my mum to come and collect us, and we walked around the Valentine's Day aisle of the store while we waited for her to arrive. All the while, Tasha and I kept a watch over the front of the store, in order to make sure she didn't find us again. We saw my mum's car, so we collapsed the stroller and took the little ones outside the store, where she had pulled up directly in front. I felt relieved for a second, until Tasha pointed over to the side of the store's entrance, where, you guessed it, the middle-aged woman sat waiting for us to come out. She was there for 15 minutes at least, waiting for me and my kids to emerge. I can't tell you how absolutely horrifying that was, to see her there waiting for us, for God knows only what reason. We had to get the strollers into the car, both of the twins buckled in, before me and Tasha could get ourselves into the car and slam the door shut. We did this as fast as humanly possible hoping that the strange woman would not have the nerve to approach us again in the meantime. There was a comfort in knowing that we had a car to get out there quickly, but we were still scared silly of the whole ordeal. Tasha said to my mum, Grandma, drive fast. Someone's been following us. And in a few seconds, we were out of the parking lot and out of the woman's sight. After we got home safely, my mom, my daughter and I discussed the incident. We shuddered to think what nefarious plans the woman had conjured up. I did not think her battery was going to die, because how else was she able to catch us up like that? It was at least half an hour, if not more, since we'd seen her and she claimed that her battery was nearly exhausted. I have a feeling it was some kind of setup. She was watching my kids for a while. We did walk the same route a few times a week, and it seemed that she just came out of nowhere. She could have come from the sketchier area of blocks downtown, but seemed to materialize out of pure darkness. It could be that she was part of a ring to either break in and burglarize homes, or worse, human trafficking. Arizona has a terrible human trafficking problem. So in nicer neighborhoods, you're not always completely safe. It could be that she was truly angry, that she couldn't find a place to charge her dying battery, and I was her last straw. Did she want to harm my children or me? I will never know. We no longer walk our neighborhood at night, and I have tried to be more open to listening to my intuition, as well as my daughter Tasha, who is wise beyond her years. All I can say is, creepy lady in the motorized chair, I hope that me and my children never bump into you again. 
The tips of my fingers tapped the top of my steering wheel. I reached down to the radio and clicked the seek button repeatedly, flipping through each different station. 5.35 p.m. That is the time my clock read as I sat in traffic along Highway 70. It was a hot summer day in mid-July. I had just gotten off work and I was ready to be home. I was used to the occasional traffic jam during rush hour, but things were moving extra slow today. I had my windows rolled down listening to Take It Easy by the Eagles. One arm rested on the outside of my window while the other held the top of my steering wheel. I sang along as the song blared through my speakers. The traffic was dragging on. I was probably only going about five miles an hour. The semi in front of me put his left blinker on to change lanes, and that's when I noticed the flashing blue and red lights ahead. Great. An accident. The tune of the eagles hummed in my ears as I tried to stay entertained. I was coming up to the first patrol car. The cop was standing outside of his car, holding orange cones in each hand. He was motioning big circles with his left arm as his right arm held the orange cone straight ahead, I guess to keep the flow of traffic moving. I kept listening to the radio and rolled forward. The back left corner of the ambulance slightly protruded into the right lane of the highway. The EMTs didn't seem to be in too big of a rush considering the magnitude of the accident. I rolled past the ambulance just as they pulled the stretcher out of the back. My eyes darted back to the road. I hoped that whoever was in this accident was okay. The cars in front of me were swerving into the left lanes ahead. I blinked a couple of times as I looked at the scraps of metal left from the totaled car. The car had been swept horizontally, blocking a portion of the right lane. I tried to make sense of what type of car it was, hoping that it was nobody that I knew, but the car was too far gone to put together a make or model. My car went past the metal debris scattered across the side of the road. I saw two paramedics holding up a black tarp to shield the view from oncoming drivers. As I passed the black tarp, I noticed this putrid smell that was radiating from it. The smell brought me back to junior year biology class, the day that we had to dissect pigs. The smell of the formaldehyde on the dead pig made me gag, and I couldn't make it through class that day. I then began to dry heave from the stench. I pulled over to the side of the road, thinking I was ready to throw up. Oncoming cars started honking at me as I cut them off to pull onto the shoulder of the highway. I took a few deep breaths and another steaming whiff of formaldehyde crossed paths with my nostrils. I threw up out the window on the pavement. I used the sleeve of my shirt to wipe my mouth off and then got behind the wheel of my car to get the hell out of there. The humidity of the day wasn't helping me feel much better and the sun was boiling down and reflecting off the metal cars around me. The exhaust from each ignition made it seem ten times hotter than it was that day. My sweaty palms gripped the top of my steering wheel. When I looked out my left mirror, I saw an old lady waving the universal signal saying that she would let me in. I turned the knob on my radio up to distract myself. I looked up and out my rear view mirror, and that is when I saw it. A lifeless, bloody hand lay just inches out from the black tarp. The paramedic must have seen the horrified look on my face because I saw him use his shoe to kick the hand back behind the tarp. I swiveled the wheels of my car into the left lane and proceeded on my way in the slow-moving traffic. Something felt off about this whole situation. I have cruised past a car crash before, but I have never seen paramedics be so oblivious to letting a dead body show. Plus the smell seemed unnatural for someone who had just died. Feeling unsteady, I looked again in my rear view mirror. Except this time, I didn't see a bloody hand. No, I saw something way more sinister looking back at me. The dead body was sticking out from the tarp, just enough for me to see the head and upper torso. My eyes darted back and forth between the paramedics, but they didn't seem to notice the change in the body's positioning. Just then, the head of the body twisted up 
and smiled at me from upside down. I don't drive on Highway 70 anymore. My longtime girlfriend and I were on this off-trail hike that had an extremely long and steep cliff to reach a small rock overhang that looked over cliffs and the ocean. As it came in view, we noticed there was an old lady already sitting up there with a sketch pad. We started making jokes, saying that maybe it was not a woman and it's actually Norman Bates waiting to throw us off the cliff. So for 20 minutes we are kidding around like this, and as we finally approached, you could not see the top because it was so steep. So we finally make it onto this tiny overhang, and the old woman turns around to look at us, and it's an insane looking man wearing a dress, and his hair is in small braids with rubber bands. And to be clear, this was not a normal looking person, not a quiet person looking to be by themselves in the wilderness. This was escaped convict, hardened face looking psychopath. We said hello, and he said nothing, but just stared at us. We tried to act as normal as possible, and calmly turned around and headed back down. So, this is a story that happened to me not too long ago. I was put on a nightly walk with a couple of friends of mine. We all live in northern Utah, and all of us in the same apartment. All three of us are very into spiritual stuff, like chakras, third eye opening, reiki, etc. So we decided that we would go out and meditate in a forested area by a park, not too far from our home. It was about 3.30 in the morning. My friend Travis was the most spiritually in tune. He had a special blanket that he always used for meditation, and it always seemed to make the place brighter. Not brighter as in the forest around us, but in a spiritually visual way, if that makes sense. So myself, Travis, and my other friend Ashton sat down to begin meditating. About 10 to 15 minutes in, we suddenly stopped hearing all the sounds of nature that we'd been hearing before. The birds stopped chirping, and we couldn't hear the crickets. Basically, everything got eerily quiet. I opened my eyes and said to Travis something along the lines of, It's too quiet. I feel like something's wrong. He opened his eyes and looked at me. He said, I can handle anything that could ever possibly harm you. So don't worry. Ashton looked at him and said, Maybe Alex is right. It is too quiet. Travis looked behind me. He got very quiet and said that we needed to leave. I started to ask him what was wrong, but he hushed me and repeated himself again. Then I heard a soft whispering that I couldn't make out. I suddenly said very loudly that I wanted to stay. Travis stood me up, grabbed the blanket out from underneath myself and Ashton and put it in his backpack and started making his way back to the path home. Once we got outside the gate of our house, Travis said he was going to walk around the block a few more times and asked me to come with him. Ashton told us he wanted to go to bed and headed inside. So me and Travis kept walking. I asked him why we didn't go inside if we were supposed to be getting away from something. And he said, Hopefully we can walk to the cemetery and lose it there. And that's what we did. We walked a mile and a half to the closest cemetery, and I was confused. Travis walked a few yards and looked around. He told me to follow him to the centre. I was still a confused young girl at the time, and had no idea what could possibly be following us, and why I couldn't see or hear it. 
we found an open grave, and Travis grabbed his knife out of his backpack and cut his collarbone until it was dripping blood. I stared on in confusion, and he used his finger to mark the open grave with his blood and walked the mile and a half back home. We were quiet the whole way back. The next morning, when myself and Ashton and Travis woke up, we ate breakfast in our bedrooms. I suddenly thought again of last night and asked Travis what was following us and why I had to walk all that way with him. He said that they were following me. As I appeared the weakest and that the only way to stop it was to mark an open grave with blood in hopes to keep it occupied until we got home. I don't know why it specifically wanted me but I hope to never find out. My childhood home was in a small town in Indiana. It was a beautiful blue Dutch colonial home in a neighborhood lined with huge old pine trees. Our house had been built in the 1800s and I always had a sense that there was something wrong about it. The neighborhood was filled with kids my age and all of the families got together for summer block parties. Pretty idyllic. The only bad thing about our neighborhood was that at the end of the cul-de-sac was the town's hospital. Our hospital kind of looked like a brick version of Hogwarts. It wasn't too bad, except that the parking lot and entrance for the emergency room essentially backed up to several of our backyards. Every once in a while we would be woken up by an ambulance. On special occasions, a helicopter would land behind our house to fly a patient to Indianapolis or Cincinnati, and the adults would bring the little kids out in our pajamas to watch it land and take off. Kind of morbid, I realize. Other than the noise and bustle of the emergency room, we rarely noticed the hospital. Sometimes we would tell ghost stories about the people who died in the hospital and how they wandered our neighborhood in the afterlife. One night in early January, several inches of snow had fallen in a few hours. As a second grader, I was looking forward to the prospect of a snow day and stayed up later than normal. I finally fell asleep and all was quiet. The snow even muffled the ambulances that came in and out that night. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up. You know when you hear something in your sleep and it wakes you up. It was one of those instances. I sat up, but heard nothing at first. I didn't see any light from under my parents' bedroom, so I knew they were asleep. I laid back down to try to fall back asleep when the noise that had woken me up came again. It's a noise that still haunts me. It was a low moan, like somebody quietly sobbing. I was perfectly still, trying to make sure I was hearing a human. Indeed, I was. The low moan turned into a sad, Help me. Over and over. I could tell it was coming from downstairs, so I snuck out of bed. My bedroom was at the top of our staircase, and looking down it, I could see right out the back door and onto our back deck. I could see several inches of snow blown up against the glass sliding door. The moaning continued, and I was convinced it was downstairs. I crept to the top of the carpeted stairs and hunched down to listen. As soon as I hunched down, I saw her. There was a woman standing at our back door. Her hair was frozen from the snow, and she was wearing a hospital gown. Her tears were frozen on her cheeks. She was barefoot. She looked right through the door and up at me, and I froze. Her moaning got louder, and I felt like it would shatter the glass sliding door. She began to pull at her gown and a bandage on her arm. When she finally looked away from me, I felt like I could move again, and I bolted. I ran to my dad and woke him up, crying that a woman was standing at our back door in the snow. He ran to the stairs, saw the woman, and immediately called 911. It turns out a patient in the dementia wing had gotten out barefoot and lost, and she had found her way to our house. The orderlies quickly came and got her. 
I don't know if she lived much longer after that. She had to have had hypothermia. After that, we tried to avoid the hospital. Even though my family moved from that home several years later, on a particularly cold and snowy night, I sometimes still have dreams of that woman. She was terrifying. My cousins live in North Dakota, and I spent winter break there freshman year in college. We were at their friend's house one night, drinking in her basement with some other girls, and it was really late, like 3 a.m. I was falling asleep, so I decided to walk home. They live in a desolate area with lots of snow, and it gets really cold, especially at night. But the houses weren't too far apart, and when the moon is out, it seems light outside. The path we always take is straight behind the house, through some wooded areas, and then more open land. And as I was shuffling home through the snow, with my head down, I look up to the left of my 10 o'clock, and probably like 75 yards away is another figure walking in the opposite direction. I saw him a split second before he saw me, and when he did, he kind of jerked his arms and his shoulders up obviously startled from the sight of me. I laughed out loud for some reason, just from the shock or something, and gave him a little wave like, oh, you startled me, ha ha, sorry, kind of thing. He just stood there and stared at me. I thought he was going to say something for a second, and so I was stopped too, just looking at him. He had a full face, ski mask on, and I could tell that it was a man, because he was really tall, but he didn't say anything. So for what felt like forever, it's just me and some stranger in a ski mask looking at each other in the desolate woods in the middle of winter at 3 a.m. A huge chill went up my spine and a voice said, you need to get the hell out of here right now. I turned and started walking as fast as I could the other direction. I have never been that scared in my life. I was a little drunk and stoned and very paranoid. I imagined me walking home from the opposite perspective and the man is running up behind me with an axe. So I started sprinting as fast as I could all the way back home, thinking that this guy could easily follow my tracks in the snow and I'm going to get murdered. Luckily I didn't, but I don't think I'll be visiting them again anytime soon. In the last apartment I lived in, during my sixth month stay in London, I shared it with four other girls. I was working so much, and for long hours. I was rarely at home, so I never really hung out with any of them. So I didn't really know them, other than they were nice enough to share a living space with. I slept in a room shared with two of these girls. They slept in a big bed, alongside the wall, with the only window, and I slept on the opposite side of the room, with the end of my bed facing the window. We lived on the first floor, but the window wasn't that close to street level, and it was a fence, and about one meter between the fence and the facade of the apartment building. No one could just walk by and look in, or get very close. Early one morning, I woke up because I thought I heard something. I could make out what it was. I opened my eyes and moved my gaze towards where the noise was coming from, and ended up lifting my head to look towards the window. There was a guy leaning through the opened window, and taking some of my roommate's things that they had placed on the windowsill. I get terrified, because I have no idea if this man has a weapon, or if he was going to climb all the way into the apartment. So I quickly lay my head back down and pretended to be asleep, for what felt like hours. I listen intentively to him rummaging around on the windowsill, and I hope that I won't hear his footfalls in the room. Luckily, he doesn't get inside, but leaves. 
I don't know for how long he was there while I laid awake. It felt like a long time. And I waited a while longer before I dared to move and peek towards the window. He was gone. And so was my roommate's things that they had placed near the window. I get up and hurry over to awake them. But they refuse to get up and just mumble to let them sleep. I tell them that we just had a feet in the window and that their things are gone and I don't want to wait around for them to wake up. Instead, I walk out of the room, my heart beating fast because I don't know if there are other burglars in the apartment, even though it sounds quiet. To my relief, the apartment is empty, but to my horror, all the windows are wide open. All of them are facing towards the street. I hurry to close them and walk back to my bedroom and cuss my roommates out for leaving all the windows open at night. But they said it was too hot in the apartment as we lived on one of the busiest streets in central London. This next story happened in the same apartment as the first. As I mentioned in that story, I worked a lot and long hours. So I was rarely at home, and I also never overslept for work, or had taken a day off. I was very careful about being punctual, hence why I couldn't figure out why I actually decided to sleep in this one morning. I remember waking up on time, but I just laid there in bed and took it easy, instead of getting up and doing my usual morning routine. I remember thinking, then since I'd never been late, and had basically done all the important things that needed to be done at work, I might as well take it a bit easier this morning. It wouldn't hurt to take the next subway train, since they did leave very often, and was only a three minute walk from my house to the station. So I didn't stress, and didn't take the same train I usually would. As I was walking towards the station later to catch the train, I saw heavily armed police, and I couldn't really get any information out of them about what happened. Only that the tube was closed. Okay, so I went to another tube station. Same thing. I tried to call my job, but the phone wasn't working. No reception at all. Suddenly, I hear people around me saying how a bomb went off. The day in question was the 7th of July 2005. That is the day of the London bombings. The train that I would have usually taken, if I had not decided to have a lion, was the train where most people got killed at Edgware Road Station. I still have no idea why to this day I decided to not be on time for work, because I am so thankful that I did. It was near Halloween time when my friends and I were telling ghost stories. My friend said she was going to tell a story about her parents' first date. She said she didn't like telling the story since it was actually true, but we pressured her to do so. To cut to the chase. The parents had spent a nice first date, and around the time that they would have said goodnight, the male in the situation, my friend's dad, suggested that they go for a midnight hike up Provo Canyon. He apparently knew the place since he had done a fair amount of rock climbing in the area. So the two drove up to the mouth of the canyon, got out of their cars, and started hiking under just the light of the stars since it was a new moon. At some point, the male starts getting a bad feeling, since the pathway ahead, which would pass under some trees, would be dark, and because it was getting to be quite late. He ignores the feeling and presses on. In later tellings of the story, the female would say that she had felt the same feeling at what was probably the same time, though she didn't know the trail like he did. A minute later, the feeling came back to the male. He ignored it again and started walking a bit of the way into the trees when his foot hit something soft in the middle of the path. Under the trees, it was too dark to see just what this soft thing was and the feeling came back stronger than ever. Instead of finding out what his foot had bumped into, 
he and the female both agreed to hightail it out of there. Years later, after being married for some time, they were watching an interview with the serial killer Ted Bundy. In response to a question asking him to describe the time that he felt the closest to being caught, he explained about the night that he lured a girl into Provo Canyon and had just killed her when he heard some people coming up the trail. He explained how he hid in the trees just in time, only to watch some guy walk right into the body and then for some reason just turned around and walked away. Seven years ago, I was on my way home after getting off work late one night. I was sitting at a red light at an intersection, trying to keep my eyes open. I was extremely tired, but was right around the corner from my house. My eyes scanned around the empty intersection I was sitting at, and there was nobody around. Just as I pressed the gas pedal, I glanced in all of my mirrors and about fainted when I thought I saw a face in my rear view mirror. My sleepy eyes jolted wide and I hit the brake in the middle of the intersection. I stared into the rear view mirror but didn't see anything. I turned around as much as I could and scanned the back seat. Nothing. I made it home a couple minutes later and quickly went inside. I first walked to my bedroom, put my cell phone on my bed, and put my work boots in my closet, and then walked back out to my living room. I peeked through the blinds and saw a man sitting in my back seat. I've never felt any fear like this before. It felt like all of my blood left my body and ice water began flowing through my veins. I ran back to my room and grabbed my phone. As I was dialing 911, I ran back to the living room window. The back door of my car was open and the man was gone. The mind has a funny way of playing tricks on us, especially when we're still young and forming the world around us. I was 13 years old when my parents allowed me to do my first overnight skatathon for the Jerry Lewis Easter Seals Foundation. Because I was an extremely athletic, but thin kid, my parents knew my interest was exactly to skate and raise money. I wasn't the kind my parents had to worry about when given a little freedom. Surprisingly to the owners and staff, I lasted through the night. My father was to pick me up at 7am. That was the time the next shift of teens would roll in and keep things going for the full 48 hours. I walked outside the wind jammers skating rink for some sunlight and fresh air, wishing I had a ponytail holder. I pulled my long brown hair which was parted in the middle up to my hands and let the cool breeze brush my neck. There was no one else there, as I was the only teen to make it for the whole night. By 7.15, I was antsy and bored, so I walked down the long hill to the highway. Back then, girls always had white skates with coloured pom-poms, and we would sling them around our necks before and after we skated, as it was easier and less awkward than carrying them. As I reached the end of the long driveway, I looked up and down the road and saw no cars in sight and no sign of my dad's big yellow work truck. Still feeling restless, I decided to cross the highway and walk a little ways towards home. Now, home was 15 miles away and I had no intention of walking that far. I just wanted to be in motion. But about a quarter of a mile, I decided to turn around. It was then that a white Volkswagen turned from the right lane and blocked my way on the left shoulder. The man in the car had dark curly hair and a moustache. His Volkswagen was like my brother's, except for the area all over the tyres. It looked kind of strange. As the crunching of sound on the gravel staved off, the car halted and the man rolled his window down. Hey. What are you doing out here alone? 
he asked with a smile. I just stood there staring at him blankly. He continued to make small talk and asked if I needed a ride and pointed to the skating ring. Still, I didn't answer. I felt very uneasy that he was offering me a ride to a building clearly just up the hill. The man looked up the road where the slope to the road gave no visibility, then down the lonely empty stretch of highway. The look in his eye had changed when he looked back at me. I heard the click of his door handle and my heart began to pound in my ears. But I somehow found the strength to shout. If you open the car door, I'll bash your damn brains out with these skates. Swinging the skates from around my neck, I assumed the position to do just that. The man looked down the highway again, but now we could hear a car coming in from behind in the distance. The man scowled at me and murmured, I didn't mean anything dirty by it, girl. And with that, it was gone. I turned around to see a blue car approaching. In the passenger seat was a boy from my class that I didn't like much. But even his harmless familiar face was a relief. I walked back up the skating ring and waited for my father. He eventually came and explained that his delay was because of my grandfather. I didn't tell my parents about it until I was an adult. And a conversation prompted me to look up the man, believe it or not. On that cool fall Sunday morning, I met the notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. When I was in eighth grade, my parents separated. Basically, my mom packed her and I up one night and we moved into my grandpa's and didn't look back. We ended up living there through my high school years. When he died, my parents officially got divorced. My mom remarried, and we moved into the city with my stepfather. My grandpa lived on the first floor of the apartment, and the owners, an elderly couple who were family to us through marriage, lived on the second floor. The property also had a small in-law cottage out in the back where my uncle lived. For some reason that I will never understand, there was no lock to get into the actual building if you entered through the back. The back door opened into a landing where there was a locked and deadbolted door to our apartment and then two sets of stairs. One led up to the also locked and deadbolted door of the second floor apartment and the other led down to the basement where there was also no lock. Our apartment could also be entered from the front of the building, but in order to access the second floor apartment or the basement, you had to go through this landing. The basement was actually pretty nice, and at one point they had started to convert it into its own apartment before they ultimately decided to make the in-law cottage instead. So in the basement, there was a full kitchen complete with an oven, a sink, and a refrigerator. The washer and dryer, which was shared by all of us, was also in the basement, as well as just some general storage stuff. The basement was entirely open except for a back room that was full of storage. It had one of those kind of swinging saloon type doors where you can see above and beneath them. The storage area was longer than it was deep, so you couldn't really see anything much behind the doors aside from shelves. You had to walk in them and turn to really see the room. One night when I was in high school, I think I was 15 at the time, after taking a shower, I saw that the laundry bin in the bathroom was pretty full, so I grabbed a ton of laundry and headed down towards the basement. It was pretty late at night but I figured I would at least get it started and move some things over in the morning. I tossed everything onto the ground and started sorting out colors when I got hit with a horrible feeling in my gut. The basement was not at all a creepy basement. It was well lit and pretty welcoming with the kitchen and everything, but for some reason that I can't explain, something just started to feel wrong. 
anyone who has ever been hit with the feeling that they were being watched knows exactly what I'm talking about. I don't know how or why it came over me, but it was something that I couldn't shake, and I found myself looking over the saloon doors and the only part of the basement that I couldn't see in its entirety. I don't know why, maybe just to assure myself I was being a big baby, I started to walk towards the back room, but stopped myself just as I reached out towards the swinging doors. I've been a horror fan for as long as I can remember and had seen more horror movies than I could count. And I knew that if that was a movie, I would be calling myself a dumbass and saying not to go into that back room. I quickly snapped my hand back and ran up the stairs, leaving all the clothes behind and into our apartment where I locked the doors and immediately told my mom that I just had the worst feeling in the basement and that I was super creeped out. Despite me not being the type of person that scares easily, she basically rolled her eyes at me and told me to go to bed. I ended up doing as I was told, though it took me a bit to shake the feeling and finally fall asleep. Later that night, my bladder woke me up and I stumbled out of my room to go to the bathroom. I didn't turn any of the lights on as I started making my way towards the bathroom because it usually woke up my grandpa and I didn't want to bother him. When I got closer to the bathroom, I noticed my mom standing in the doorway of her bedroom and something looked off and it took me a moment to realize that she was clutching the phone. She then noticed me and whispered to me to get against the wall, which I did without hesitation. It took a few moments for the grogginess to wear off and my eyes to adjust to the darkness before I could see what she did. My mom's bedroom was immediately off of the kitchen. The kitchen was where the back door that led to the landing and the basement was located. The door had a tiny window up top with a small but thick curtain. It was thin enough that you could see that someone was outside of the door, but thick enough to not be able to make out any of the features of the person on the other side. But there was someone on the other side of the door and every now and then, the doorknob would move and you could hear this scratching sound was on the other side. I have never been so afraid in my entire life. I'm not sure how I managed to do what I did next. It was like someone else had taken control over me entirely. I slid down against the wall that I was clinging to and started to crawl against it in the darkness towards the kitchen. My mom looked petrified watching back and forth between me and the back door. She kept whispering for me to stop and go back, but I kept moving forward, low and against the wall, towards the counter where I carefully grabbed a butcher knife. I was shaking the whole time I moved with the knife in my hand on the ground next to the fridge, which was next to the door the man was trying to get into. I had this horrible feeling that I was going to be killed, but if I was, I wasn't going to go down without a fight. It felt like I sat there forever in the darkness, next to the door with my mom hiding in the bedroom doorway across from me, just waiting. But it was only for a few minutes. My mom had already called 911 before I had woken up and stumbled my way towards the bathroom. The lights from approaching squad cars soon filled the kitchen and from the other side of the door, I could hear a sudden clamoring and commotion and the slam of the back screen bursting open as the would-be assailant took off running. It was around 3 a.m. when this happened, so it was completely dark outside, and we lived right by some train tracks and very thick bushes and trees that made it easy for the man to escape the cop that pursued him. The police came in and took statements from my mom and I. My grandpa, who was partially deaf, had managed to sleep through almost the entire thing until the police came through to search the apartment and make sure that we were okay. The outside of the door and the doorknob were both covered in deep scratches, like someone had been going at it with a knife, trying to figure out how to get in, but that wasn't the most horrifying part to me. That was reserved 
for the basement. The clothes that I had brought down were not where I had left them, and they had been thrown about and disheveled, and the back room, the one with the swinging door that I had stopped myself from going in, the boxes that were out of view had also been thrown about, all opened, obviously gone through, with some things missing, and there were some wrappers from food on the floor. He had been down there looking for something to steal. He was down there when I went down to do laundry. I had almost walked into that room, and based on what we had seen on the door, he had a knife. To this day, I can't help but find myself sometimes thinking about what would have happened if I had walked into that room. When I was a kid, my dad would always take me to this one specific beach to go fishing. I loved it so much that even when I grew up, I continued to go there, sometimes with my friends and sometimes alone. This story happened when I was alone. I backed my truck up to the water, released my boat, parked my truck up at the top of the ramp and I headed out. It was a beautiful day, but a bit overcast. I enjoyed the occasional nap while out on the water, and today, I needed one. I kicked my feet up, and I put my head back. I must have fell into a pretty deep sleep, because when I woke up, my boat was still floating peacefully. But to my horror, there was another boat right next to mine. I stood up in surprise and saw that there was another fisherman sitting on his boat in a chair, looking at me. He was older than me, maybe in his fifties. He had long brown hair that was slicked back, and honestly, he looked like bad news. He gave me a weird smile and said, Rise and shine. I nervously chuckled and told him I didn't mean to doze off and I had to be on my way. My heart started to pound when the guy said, Nope. But he didn't move from his chair. I got up and started the motor on my boat and drove away. I have no idea why he said nope to me when I told him I had to leave. I have no idea why he just sat there and let me leave. But damn, that was so nerve-wracking. My parents divorced when I was around one years old, and my mom decided to go to college shortly after we moved into our own tiny house. My mom didn't have those crazy party years as she got pregnant with me relatively young, so she saw this as her opportunity to do so. Usually, my grandparents or her best friend would watch me on the nights she would go have fun, but sometimes there was no one available and my mom would throw small parties at our place instead. I don't remember most of these, just small flashes here and there of our crowded living room and kitchen, or salt and pepper songs blasting in the backyard. My mom had this guy friend, we'll call him Jeremy, who came to every party. I loved Jeremy, and my mom did too, partly because he was gay and she never felt threatened by him, and partly, he also adored me. I was a three-year-old girl obsessed with anything Disney princess, and every time I saw Jeremy, he would bring me anything cheap and Disney princess related. Anything from these growing sponges to crayons. This, of course, meant I trusted and loved Jeremy. He would call me chicken legs, which to a three-year-old was hilarious and insulting at the same time since everyone had always said I was a really skinny kid. However, I delighted in the little nickname when he used it and would only answer to that when he came around. One day, during the summer, my mom was hosting a small barbecue and Jeremy had come over early to help prepare. It was just the three of us and my mom told me she remembered Jeremy constantly checking his watch. She wrote it off as he was just making sure everything would be ready on time. But around five o'clock, Jeremy suddenly pulled me into his arms, saying I was being a bit fussy and wanted some juice. My mom hadn't noticed I was being fussy, 
and to this day swears I had been happily playing on my own. She says Jeremy took me inside, through the front door, and out into the front yard where another car was waiting, without missing a beat. I trusted Jeremy, but to this day, I'm so thankful that I started screaming my head off as the passenger door opened. Jeremy proceeded to shove me inside when my mother came rushing through the front door. My mother is not one to be fucked with. She's the toughest woman I know, and in every essence, she is the mother bear. She came barreling out of the front door and charged across the lawn. Jeremy saw this and froze, pulling me from the car just as it sped off. My mom proceeded to ask him what the fuck he was doing. She already knew, but Jeremy fed her some bullshit of taking me to the store real quick because we were out of juice. He said I had agreed to go, and he thought it was fine since they were friends. Mom snatched me away and told him to get the fuck out of there and to never come back. You don't just take someone's kid without telling them. She never wanted to see him near her or me ever again. I never saw Jeremy after that, but I didn't understand why. I asked about him a few times after that, but of course eventually forgot, as toddlers often do. I don't know what instinct told me to scream, as I had thought of Jeremy as a family member, but I'm so glad I did. Wherever Jeremy was planning on taking me, there was no way it could have been good, and some sick part of me wonders if my pet name had anything to do with that destination. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Again, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my good friend and collaborator today, Being Scared. I'm sure that you were all highly impressed by his incredible work tonight. So, what is the logical thing to do here? It is, of course, to go over to his channel and continue with part two of these amazing stories for a rainy night. Don't miss out. Link is in the description and on screen now. I'll see you there. Let the thunderstorm continue.